Dear guests, hello and welcome. I'm Ilkay Demirdağ. Uh, at today's panel discussion, we will talk about the empowerment of aid through investment with a specific focus on Africa. Russia's invasion on Ukraine has reminded us how closely linked global supply chains are, uh, creating threats for the world's poor by hindering efforts to fight poverty, food insecurity, and famine. This is taking a healthy toll on many African countries. To make matters worse, an issue specifically related to the African continent deserves attention, which is the design of mainstream rural development. Additionally, global price inflation is having a proportionally higher impact on non-resilient households of the uh, region, uh, such as Africa, where there are no shop observers in place. All of these factors deepen the food security issue in the African countries especially where important food producing small farmers do not receive the right kind of support at the right time. So today, a key topics of our discussion are how can we achieve a genuine and long term uh, impact to address these issues and how can we empower foreign aid through investment. Our distinguished speakers are from uh, uh, Africa, Australia, uh, Hong Kong and Turkey today. So let's uh, let's begin. Before we start uh, our panel discussion, I will give the word to Kubra Koldemir, who is the uh, sustainability business writer at Sustain Finance and researcher at Argudan Governance Academy. Um, Kubra, uh, many decades of discussions and research have evidenced that too much aid uh, to Africa fails to achieve a lasting impact. Given the inefficiency of aid to Africa model, how can we evolve to a model which is more to uh, direct investments to Africa? Thank you, Ikai. <clears throat> so uh, first of all, it is true that aid to Africa uh, has not been working for the longest time. And this idea has actually been supported and reiterated by a number of both global and African leaders. Uh, approaches to financial assistance are often too institutionalized, too time bound, and overexposed uh, to corrupt practices. Therefore, they fail to comprehend the situation on the ground. There is another specific issue related to the African continent, and this is the design of mainstream rural development. Several African countries are experiencing the highest urbanization rates globally. Lack of economic activity in rural areas leads people to overcrowd the cities in the hope of finding a better future. This, unfortunately, causes a vicious circle of bad health, bad nutrition and sanitation without necessarily leading to more employment opportunities. This is why I would, it would make a difference if some funding could primarily flow to rural Africa. Therefore, meaningful investments could, for example, be made in commercially viable social enterprises focused on agriculture. In other words, aid to Africa should partner with commercial operations on the ground and receive acceptance from the local people. Individuals on the ground are indeed the best people to design sustainable solutions for local problems. One such privately held social initiative is Mubora. We recently used them as a good practice example in our article featured in the Financial Times. And with this introduction to today's topic, I would like to leave the word to our actual speakers. Thank you, Kuba, for uh, giving us the base uh, for our discussion and giving the word to uh, Adrian as well. Uh, so I would like to move on to Edwin, who is the founder and CEO of Mobura, which was uh, uh, the uh, case study uh, Kubra mentioned. Uh, Mobura is a Malawi-based uh, uh, for-profit social enterprise, uh, and its purpose is to offer an alternative to aid uh, dependency and launch rural uh, African economies by providing digital and physical platform to support women smallholders and entrepreneurs and by agriculturally, financially, and health-wise, uh, uh, digitally, including users. Adrian, welcome. Great to uh, have you with us today. Uh, as a social enterprise, how do you generate, uh, actually, returns for your investors? Uh, thank you, Ilkay and Kubra. 
Yes, at the moment, our, our primary revenue streams are um, on the uh, fintech side. We've digitized village banking, the first to do that in, in Malawi. Uh, village banking is uh, generally women savers and borrowers uh, collectively saving and then providing microfinance to uh, financially include themselves where they're financially excluded uh, typically from uh, mainstream banks and um, uh, where there are barriers to entry like high fees for some of the other financial services available. So we offer a very affordable uh, village banking platform that um, has seen us financially include um, over 500 women uh, in just one community inside a year. Um, that's seen us uh, fund 400 businesses uh, to the tune of about $150,000 in, in just one village. Um, the returns on that are um, in the region of 20% over six months, um, which is considerably uh, cheaper than um, any of the existing offerings, microfinance offerings in, in the market. Um, but the beauty about it is um, we just top up um, the, the collective savings. So if, for example, a, a women's group has saved 500,000 kwacha, but the loan applications come in for a million, um, they'll ask us to top up the extra 500,000. Um, but they earn the 20% on, on their money and we earn the 20% on our money that we top up with. And those loans are used to, to fund businesses, um, nothing else. They can't go shopping or, um, or go down to the pub or anything like that. So uh, it's, it's you know, generating, generating income um, as, as their businesses are supported by us as well. Um, the second revenue stream is um, our agricultural production. So we, we're in growing partnerships with groups of predominantly women farmers uh, on community land. And um, so we put in clusters of market gardens with, with as I say, mostly women's groups of uh, smallholder farmers. Um, we put in all of the infrastructure, the solar power, um, fencing. Uh, we have a technical team on site. Um, and we grow vegetables at the moment um, for local markets, uh, for local lodges, uh, for supermarkets in town, um, and and we share the profit. So we we put all the capex in um, one a single hectare market garden could cost in the region of uh, ten to fifteen thousand dollars, which is you know a lot of money, um, which they obviously cannot access. So. The crazy thing is we've got the third biggest body of water in Africa um, sitting adjacent to millions of people sitting on great soil who are waiting for the annual rains to uh, plant the, uh, the annual maize crop um, cycle. Um, and the rest of the year that land sitting unproductive, not achieving anything. So what we're trying to do is, is, is generate agricultural activity um, generate profits off that, which we share with our farming groups, who can then take those um, th their share of the profits and put it into the village bank to get access to finance to then fund the business. So, and off the off off that, there are a bunch of other peripheral supporting um, functions we provide, including one of our service provider partners um, uh, locates a clinic within our uh, our service centres, um, and we make a small. Uh, uh, contribution on each pack of the pills that is sold. Um, but we also offer a medical aid hanging off that clinic service provision, a very basic medical aid, but but a good one, um, a primary healthcare medical aid. So, so uh, to summarize, there's um, revenue generated through, uh, through the FinTech microfinance uh, village bank, through the sales of vegetables and um, th uh, through a medical aid and pharmaceutical sales. Adrian, thank you so much. This is really incredible. And what you do on the ground on a multi-dimensional level is really uh, very impressive. I'm mostly impressed that you started with a woman. Uh, so congratulations. So taking what you have said, I'll, I'll move on to Barry um, and get his views. Uh, very welcome. Uh, to increase trade, higher foreign direct investment and a stronger uh, domestic savings, uh, the focus for aid and investments should be on innovative, ethical, private sector, commercial enterprises that connect, you know, funds directly to the local people on the ground, as Adrian uh, mentioned. 
Uh, with your experience, uh, can you share with us any any enterprises that do that with specifically using technology and innovation? Yeah, I'm ha very happy to do that, Ilke. And the whole topic of both rural and um, and the interface between aid and private investment is very close to my heart, and it's something I'm very very active with. And just to set some context, um, actually from a family background, I've got a very very deep. Um, connection into the um, African agricultural and food sector. So my great grandfather actually was the the very um, early ag tech pioneer of going back to the late 1800s and 1900s. Um, I grew up in Zimbabwe, and he actually invented millimil, which for those who are from Southern Africa would understand that's now the staple diet, and actually built that into the largest food company in Zimbabwe, which is still in existence 115 years later. Although my family is no longer involved in that, so. It's quite the heritage. And actually, the way he did it was he was actually working very closely with small-scale African farmers. As the family story goes, um, he actually saw the small-scale farmers growing maize, a maize crop, not all of it was being used. He worked out a way to actually use the whole thing and created this thing called millimeal or maize meal, which actually became the staple diet. So it's a very deep family history on that. Um, and this, um, this interface around innovation, again, I'm, I'm chairman of a group called Impact Rooms, um, which is actually focused on facilitating um, um, investment from around the world into African innovation. And, you know, just to put again some context um, why rural is so important, um, up to 30% of jobs on the African continent are actually linked into agriculture in some form. Um, and of that, um, a, a big chunk of that, effectively a whole bunch of small scale businesses, um, many of which are actually more than 50% are actually led by women. So it's actually a social um, component of the infrastructure. Um, and if you look at, you know, um, the general trends in Africa, very young population, um, um, big issues around providing employment in a formal economy, um, which is driving that urbanization. So there's an opportunity um, to actually um, effectively create um, informal but very innovative um, initiatives, commercial initiatives, um, many of which can and should be in rural to stop people feeling the need to go into, into the city. So that, that's just some general context. Um, I've got some very personal, um, you know, um, direct experience of some of the issues. Um, I, I was actually invited to be part of a discussion group, which is put together by the um, EU um, Parliament, actually, effectively. So um, the Deputy President of the EU Parliament um, was actually put in charge of looking at um, EU aid to Africa and what was actually happening. So I, I got myself into a discussion policy group around all of that. And it was actually, <laughs> I didn't quite know how to feel about it because... Um, what I found out was that, you know, tens of billions of euros of aid actually does not even get allocated, right? It just sits in a budget and actually doesn't get spent. So that's just a starting point. And then, you know, the, the, the aid that does get spent ends up, you know, a big chunk of it is there's no concrete um, um, sort of measurable social impact coming out of that. So it's just, you know, for all sorts of reasons. Um, but um, the Deputy President of the EU Parliament, um, who is actually running this initiative, you know, she said, well, what we need to do is focus, how are we going to create jobs, and particularly in rural? So she was trying to work out how you know, big chunks of money could go. Um, there was meant to be a big discussion of all the EU foreign ministers um, in, in February, March, and then, of course, the Ukraine war happened and things that sort of, you know, <laughs> unfortunately, fall on the back burner. So that's one specific um, sort of context. Um, in terms of actual examples, um, through my chairmanship of um, Impact Rooms, which is the connected between um, capital and innovation. I work with a bunch of very interesting businesses. Probably the most interesting is a group called Tingo, which is actually um, based out in Nigeria. Um, it is, in my view, the leading FinTech ag tech business in Africa. It actually serves 12 million small scale farmers um, in rural Nigeria. I and mean, again, more than 50% of, of those are actually um, uh, women. Um, they started the business, um, Dozi Mbawozi, who's the founder, um, really, really um, visionary uh, man. And he um, started off by um, leasing um, lower cost mobile phones to people in rural, in rural Nigeria. So just the first part was connect, right? Get, them, get people into the digital world. And when you break down the supply chain, value chain for agriculture, um, there are many, many issues that the small scale farmers are dealing with. You know, it's almost deja vu for what my great grandfather might have been thinking through at the time. Um, but you actually have, um, you have up to 60% of crops getting lost from planting all the way through to sale. So the farmers lose 60%, you know, it, it varies by crop. Um, the, because there's so many small scale farmers, they have very limited pricing power around what they're actually producing. And the best example I can give around that is that um, the president of Ghana, it's probably now going back nine, nine, 10 months, actually visited Switzerland, um, where I've spent a lot of time recently, met with the president of Switzerland and said, 
we're not going to sell you any more cocoa because it's um, present for your chocolate industry. And the president of Switzerland said, you can't do that, right? You know, 70% of this, the cocoa going to, into the Swiss chocolate industry comes from Ghana. And the response was, well, you've got a 200 billion US dollar industry. We get $6 billion back in Ghana. It's not fair, right? What's going on here? And part of what is happening is there's many, many intermediaries, the small scale people growing, the farmers growing the cocoa in that, in that example are not getting the end pricing, right? They get this tiny little part of what the end price, the cocoa ends up getting sold to the Swiss chocolate industry. And they put all their margins on top. So um, Tingo is trying to solve and is actually solving many of those issues. And they intend to become a Pan-African group um, with, they're targeting hundred million farmers. Um, they're a very successful business. They're actually just in the process of listing on NASDAQ in the US, generate very high revenue, very high profitability. Um, they had to go out and actually build a broadband network in rural Nigeria to actually make sure the communication was working. So, you know, there's a big investment on their part. But the big thing they're doing now is they have this centralized marketplace, which they call Mawasa, which actually is there to help um, small scale farmers get inputs into agriculture. So, and they're also trying to get sustainable inputs. So, get rid of the chemicals, you know, start getting natural solutions coming in. But equally importantly, they're actually looking to consolidate the outputs, you know, what people actually grow and produce. And that's a game changer. Right. So my background, you know, I've been very deep in, in global investment markets for a very long time. Um, once you can forward sell volumes of commodities, then you open up a whole new way of actually financing um, those commodities and you actually make get more of that value coming back to those farmers. Um, and that's exactly what Tingo as a great example is in, it will do, right? So rather than selling, you know, 20 cocoa beans or you know, 1,000 cocoa beans, you'll consolidate a million cocoa beans, and then you'll go out and you'll actually sell it and get more of that margin coming back. And then you can start forward selling, right? You can also critically start putting financial services around with things like payments, which you know, is, is a core component, but also things like weather insurance. So you, know, you start wrapping all of these things. And you know, to your point earlier, Ilka, around what's happening in Ukraine and how that, how that actually res you know, sort of resonates. I, I was at a I'm actually in San Francisco at the moment. I was at a great function last night, which is all focused on African investment. And there was a lot, you know, a lot of people from Africa there, including myself and, and from around the world. But um, a lot of the discussion was how the perception and actuality of risk around Africa is just there's a, this big, you know, it's just unrealistic. And in fact, you know, Ukraine is saying, well, Ukraine Russia war is saying, well, Africa is not as risky as a lot of people might have thought compared to that. So I think it's a wonderful time for Africa. Um, I sort of call it the Africa rising um, uh, period in, in the world. And you know, I'm delighted to be contributing whatever way I can. And, um, and policy development and how to actually frame that, I think is a critical part. Thank you, Barry, for the uh, insights from the uh, real uh, uh, part of the uh, story. Uh, so I'll move on to Adrian. Uh, as Barry said, you know, there, uh, Africa is so underdeveloped and it takes so much attention for aid and investments, uh, but obviously there's no one um, solution to fit all cases, especially considering the social, economic, and um, ge ge geographic uh, diversity uh, in the region. So in your opinion, uh, what are the risks of conducting uh, businesses in a traditional way in Africa? Yeah, so, I mean, not far from where we are on the same latitude um, to us in, in, in Southern Lakeshore, Lake Malawi, you know, across to the east, a few hundred kilometers, we've got an Islamist insurgency that's um, been spinning out of control in northern Mozambique. Um, now, we operate in a, in a largely Muslim community down on the Southern Lakeshore, um, and we're financially, digitally, health and agriculturally including these communities. Um, we also have digital channels, we have a youth club. Um, but we're we're you know we're, we're taking this this raw market and creating something coherent out of it. We're we're we're, we're taking a largely illiterate, uh, densely populated community and actually turning it into a productive marketplace with us sitting at the middle with our digital and our physical platform. Um, and this provides a buffer against that sort of message seeping into um, in, in into these. As, as Barry mentioned, largely young populations, 50% of, uh, of these rural populations are under the age of 18, um, and 70% and of those are unemployed. 
So, um, you know, a radicalized message from across the border is an attractive thing. So th there are no targets in, in Malawi for that insurgency because they've been targeting, um, you know, a very large um, new oil and gas development uh, in northern Mozambique, which is billions of dollars of investment from the likes of Total. Um, and all of those guys have gone home um, because, because it's spun out of control. Um, you know, so there are these very narrow windows of opportunities to prevent your Boko Haram type insurgencies spinning out of control and, and, and you know, taking us right back down to, to ground zero. You know, it's bad enough as it is. Poverty is extreme in, in these communities um, from a financial perspective. But the view I take is when you arrive and you walk around these places and you see the third body, the third largest body of water in Africa, you see the soil, you see, you know, the, the millions of people, um, you know, there's your ready market, there, there's your agricultural land, you know, you can solve the food security issues locally, um, and you can export internationally, you know, we can add value to crops like mangoes, we can dry them, honey, you know, there are all sorts of products that can be sent, um, sent overseas to international markets to to further turbocharge the earnings potential of these communities. But the earnings potential of these communities is enormous, absolutely enormous. And, um, and Embora is showing um, how, how there is not, I'm not saying we are the answer to everybody's prayers, but you know, we are part of, part of the answer. Um, and we, you know, we, we take some donor funding from, um, from, from Big Aid. We've received a UNDP grant. Um, the great thing about a social enterprise receiving donor money like that, it you know where we're pioneering a new a new approach to development to rural development, um, it it helps us extend our runway. You know where we're otherwise raising through equity, a bit of grant funding gives us a bit more breathing space. It's great for our investors because obviously it adds value to the business, um, buys us a bit more time, and um, and we use that very very smartly to to build social capital in these communities which is what enables us to 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 ultimately be successful um, so i think what we're talking about here is you know is just engaging in some double loop thinking here and and and, and let's stop banging bashing our heads against a brick wall and let's let's start partnering you know there are other projects in malawi that are quite successful where you've got um, big aid partnering with the private sector. Um, there's a USAID funded project called Agdiv, very well run. Um, they put money in some of the big agricultural businesses that have traditionally been growing tobacco, um, who have smallholders growing for them. Um, and they're now diversifying their crop mix into, into horticulture and um, cash crops, you know, soya, um, uh, maize, um, uh, ground nuts, that, that sort of thing. So we're able at Embora to get access to more and more land. Um, this is, as I said, community land. So there's no land grabbing. We're not buying the land. Um, and you know, initially we start with horticulture. We add orchards, um, citrus, mangoes, and then we'll start to move into into cash crops. Your you know your groundnuts, your soya, that sort of thing. And on top of that, some light industrialization with with products like like dried mango. But those then provide the economic opportunities. That, that prevents um, things like a you know a local insurgency spinning out of control. You know we've got uh, a Malawian population increasing at four percent a year, doubling every ten years. We have twenty million people today. Um, in another 10, 12 years, there'll be forty million people. How do we feed those people? Those are, most of them will be young. Most of them will be unemployed. You know. What kind of human security issues are we are we actually looking at here? You know, we don't have a lot of time, and the private sector really needs to come to the party. <clears throat> you know, uh, private investors really need to come to the party, and 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 be part of the solution. Um, last point I'll make is uh, interestingly, last year, forty nine billion uh, of overseas development aid went into sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in the same time frame, only four billion. Uh, was privately invested into the sorts of companies that Barry's been describing. Um, you know that that's a scandal. That's an absolute scandal. You know, and all of those aid projects are time bound. Um, folks come, international folks come in, and they leave after a few years, 
and, and projects collapse. You know, the local people are just not literate enough. They don't have enough human capital to, you know, to, to do something with, with, with a little kickstart, which is why we embed ourselves in those communities. Um, we use technology, a digital platform, to, to turbocharge impact, to enable us to do it with fewer people. Um, but we're employing local, predominantly women from these villages, training them to run our Bora hubs. And they can then run those standalone. Uh, and around that, you've got the agriculture happening. So, you know, everybody's been financially, agriculturally, digitally, uh, and health included under one umbrella. Um, but that sort of thing with the digital channels can go a long way to preventing um, you know, radicalized type messaging um, or just abject poverty worsening from spiral out of, uh, spiraling out of control and, and, and creating destabilizing civil unrest in, 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 in these very important food producing communities. Edwin, thank you so much for highlighting the importance of private investments, also the involvement of local uh, community uh, to make uh, these projects successful. I think one way of doing it is, is really um, transferring impact funds uh, to the field. And Barry is, is, is somebody who is really, uh, really focused on that. Uh, Barry, I will move on to you uh, and talk about a little bit of uh, about uh, impact investing, which directs capital towards enterprises, which really generate social and environmental benefits. And of course, Africa is a good place to start. As Adrian said, it's so underdeveloped. Uh, almost 600 pe million people in Africa lack access to uh, electricity. Four out of 10 live without safe drinking water. Uh, one fifth of uh, primary uh, age children are out of uh, school and 237 million people are malnourished. So um, this is really an area where really impact investing could really direct into and you're really uh, doing that. So as an investor, how do you allocate your capital at and measure your impact uh, in your uh, projects. Uh, um, so Ilkay, um, again, just with a little bit of context, um, I'm, I'm actually um, always towards the optimistic end of the spectrum naturally, I guess, but um, you know, the numbers are actually telling a really interesting story. So if you look at the amount of private capital that's been going into innovation across the African continent, five years ago, it was around 200 million US dollars. Last year it was um, over 5 billion US dollars. Um, and it'll be you know, higher again, significantly higher again this year. Um, and you know, the, um, much of that investment, private investment capital has tended to focus on four markets. So you know, so-called four big investment markets for, for innovation, which is South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and Egypt, which is an interesting one because Egypt created its own very innovative ecosystem. Um, but it's now starting to spread, right? So it's actually going, starting to go into a lot more countries. So you know, that's, again, a general picture. Yes, it's... Um, on you know, a lot of metrics, it's not great, but um, there's a lot of innovation happening and, um, and locally driven innovation. So people saying, this is how we can change it ourselves. Um, in terms of how I think about it, um, so I talk, you know, um, regardless of where I'm impact investing, and I do it not just in Africa, but um, I talk about it as being a spectrum, right? At the one end of the spectrum, you might have outright aid, philanthropy, um, supposedly no expectation on commercial returns, but you know, often there is something that you have to actually deliver against that. At the other end of the spectrum is basically totally financial, right? Internal rates of return. I need to generate 25% per annum, whatever the number is. Um, but to me, the interesting part is the in-between part. Um, and there it's, it's where on that spectrum you want to sit. Um, so I, you know, I am at an absolute minimum, you know, you, you have a lot of um, guiding frameworks and um, there's probably too many actually. Um, where, you know, where um, impact investing is actually resting, what are the right frameworks? Um, but, you know, you have at the highest level, UN Sustainable Development Goals, you know, the 17 goals, um, which to me are great, but it's a little bit, for me, it doesn't translate directly into decision-making, you know, explicitly across all of the detail. Um, then you have ESG, right, which again, to me is, um, is predominantly, in my view, government-driven and big company-driven. And it, you know, it has been in the past, it's improving, it has tended to be a little bit more ticker box. So, um, but again, um, it's there, it's, it, it serves a great purpose. But I think we can go the next layer down, right? And the next layer down, we've actually, to me, um, you know, the famous Google saying, do no evil, um, you know, we do no evil. Right? I think that's almost a basic starting point, right? Is to say, when the money gets allocated, there are certain things we will not do, right? So we just won't, if, if they generate these negative 
impacts, we won't do it, right? Then the next question is, so once you've ex excluded that from your prism of deciding where to invest, how much explicitly do you want to put into the um, non-financial impact outcomes versus the financial impact outcomes? And different investors will have different views, right? Um, but where I come from, I actually like to see the communities in which the investment is taking place, helping to define how that um, impact outcomes are going to look, right? So I don't want to be the guy saying, um, you know, it, it looks like that because I'm coming in from top and I'm ask the community, uh, you know, ask the markets that we're actually trying to get into. You know, again, using the Tingo example, it was, what do you as small scale farmers need to actually do better, right? Create employment, you know, um, reduce your waste, get access to all sorts of things. So you start by asking, um, and Adrian, um, without going all the detail of, of your, uh, of the way you operate, but it seems like you do do that. And it's actually a core component of actually engaging with the communities. Thank you, Barry. Okay, I would like to thank our speakers for this uh, super interesting conversation. Before we close the panel, I'll give the word to Paul Smith, uh, who is the uh, founder of Sustain Finance and uh, president, uh, um, former president of the CFA Institute. Uh, Paul, welcome. Uh, it has been a great discussion and I would like to give the word to you to wrap it up. But um, uh, what we have said basically is Ukrainian war has deprivatized the global agenda and that what happened in a uh, world economic forum that was held in may as well uh, the discussions were were unfortunately uh, shadowed by the war uh, i'm just wondering you know how this has changed the um uh, investors uh, appetite towards uh, esg in specific regards to uh to food security thank you okay and, and thank you to adrian and to barry that was um um, really educational and fascinating, and um, and Barry, I think, very hopeful as well. So that uh, hopefully your optimism and, and uh, uh, carries forward, and certainly what Adrian is doing with Mbora and things are, are really exciting and groundbreaking. I think in, in answer to your question, Ilka, as, as uh, Barry said, I think risk perceptions has, have changed in the international uh, asset management community. Um, I think the challenge with Africa will remain one of size at this stage for mainstream investors. They struggle to deploy the capital that they need to, to deploy. But the key change is, is as I say, is, is, is risk. And in the ESG world, uh, obviously governance risk, um, which has been something at the macroeconomic level that has been um, uh, ignored. And so I think, uh, I think all of those things mean that um, money at the margin will flow into projects that are based around not just food security, but around local production, reducing transportation costs, um, you know, gender equality. I think those big themes are coming into focus um, very strongly as a result of, uh, of, of what's been um, happening in the Ukraine. Um, I, I think the other issue that perhaps is is has been lost uh, in the uh, in in the the, the, the debate around uh, Ukraine is, is obviously as we as we've said that the demographics of Africa um, are uh, an enormous opportunity but an enormous problem as well. I can't remember exactly the numbers, but Africa's going to add um, a billion people over the next forty or fifty years. And where are those people going to go if Africa can't feed them properly? Um, the vast majority of those will become economic migrants. And, uh, you know, that's a real challenge uh, for the world, for Europe particularly, uh, which is on Africa's doorstep. Uh, how are we going to cope with that population explosion of young people, 50% of whom are going to be young males? How do we cope with that if we can't fix people in place and give them economic opportunities within their uh, countries of origin. And I think that's a significant challenge um, that we're going to face going forward and one that the investing community perhaps hasn't focused on as yet, um, as it focuses much more on, on the mechanics of, as we've said, food security, fuel security, um, and also to some extent, um, uh, vegetable agriculture over animal agriculture, which is becoming also a theme within the ESG world. So I do think money is going to flow. I do think size of project is the problem. 
um, but risk perception is moving in Africa's favor. So um, I would expect to see um, portfolio management um, uh, uh, being reweighted towards the African continent and away from some of the other areas of the world uh, as we go forward over the next 10 to 20 years. So like Barry, like Adrian, I think um, this is uh, Africa's moment. Uh, I do think that very strongly that this is going to be a watershed um, next five to 10 years for Africa. But we have to make sure that we are able to produce uh, the right um, political security for people's investments. Uh, we have to make sure that development is not done on the massive scale that it's been done, for instance, in the US, which is obviously very destructive towards water supply, towards uh, forestry as well. We have to make sure that the projects are um, ecologically sound as well as economically sound. And above all else, we have to give this young burgeoning population of Africa um, a reason for hope within Africa. And I think those are challenges that um, from a Western perspective are very, very definitely in our best interests to make sure that we rise to uh, and, uh, and solve. So. Paul, thank you. As always, that was a great summary. And I'm really hoping that, you know, we will not do the same mistakes that we have done uh, at the rest of the world in Africa and really um, act more responsibly uh, and create good impact uh, for the society and the environment there. So thank you all for this incredible discussion. It has been uh, really educational for me. And I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, our listeners will find it very interesting as well. So today we discussed about uh, traditional aid models, uh, the need to convert to investment driven developments, uh, role of impact investing, uh, securing returns and sec uh, scaling up solutions in Africa. Uh, we hope that the uh, discussion has been fruitful and we look forward to welcoming you in our upcoming events. And until then, take care.